Hi everyone and welcome to the second part of our series on acute coronary syndromes and this episode will be dedicated to the mighty troponin which is part of the essential workup of any acute coronary syndrome and it happens to be one of the trickiest molecules in cardiology. Welcome back doctor. In the previous episode we talked about acute coronary syndromes, the definitions, history taking essentials, physical examination, and ECG interpretation. We learned about chest pain types, the significance of physical examination, ST elevation thresholds, de Winter sign, Wellen sign, ST depression, and T wave changes. We also briefly mentioned troponin, but we should delve into it further. Yes, after the previous episode, I've received several questions about troponin, and I personally see lots of troponin tests done out of clinical context, mostly in the emergency departments and in the intensive care units. And cardiologists are supposed to respond to these consultations and manage properly. I will discuss how to respond to these troponin elevations when consulted. We'll also discuss what is high sensitivity troponin, how it changed our practice, and finally, we'll elaborate on troponin protocols in the emergency departments in patients with acute chest pain. So, welcome aboard. Welcome to Cardio Buzz, your one stop shop for all things cardiology. We bring the latest news and research on heart health. We also provide the practicing doctors with summaries of the latest cardiology guidelines to help improve the knowledge and the practice. Let's first make sure you understood the concepts that we discussed last time. Tell me, what would be your diagnosis for a 50-year-old man who presents with prolonged cardiac pain, has a normal examination, an ECG showing ST depression in the lateral lead, and his troponin is not elevated? Well, um, that would be unstable angina. Right, it seems you're starting to grasp the concepts. Then, what would be your diagnosis of the same patient? if troponin was elevated. In that case, it would be a myocardial infarction because troponin is elevated. Exactly, that's right. How would you diagnose a patient with chronic renal failure on dialysis who has no cardiac symptoms, but he comes with a lab test that shows elevated troponin? Well, here we have troponin elevation without cardiac disease, so that would be myocardial injury. Exactly, that's right. Wonderful. Let's take a step back and recount the history of troponin from its inception. Our understanding of troponin has evolved dramatically in the last two decades. Troponin is an integral part of the cardiac myocyte. It regulates the interaction between actin and myosin. Troponin has almost completely replaced the old test creatine kinase, CK and CKMB, which used to be our main biomarker for myocardial injury. We almost abandoned CK because troponin is cardiac specific. By cardiac specific, you mean that troponin exists only in the heart? Troponin is found in both cardiac muscles and in skeleton muscles, but the cardiac isoform has a different structure, and therefore it can be measured in isolation using specific chemical assays. That's why troponin elevations are always related to the heart. In the early days, we thought that troponin should not exist in the bloodstream unless cardiomyocytes were seriously injured or disrupted. Okay, I understood. You meant that any troponin detection in the blood meant myocardial injury or myocardial infarction, right? Yes, that's what we thought in the old troponin assays. In the late 1990s and the early 2000s, we thought that normally troponin blood levels should be zero. Any detectable troponin in the blood simply meant myocardial injury or myocardial necrosis. Later on, we got sensitive and recently high sensitivity assays that were able to detect very low levels of troponin in normal individuals. The sensitive assay allows the detection of troponin in 20 to 50% of healthy individuals. The high sensitivity assays allow for the detection of troponin in up to 95% of healthy individuals. But troponin is part of the myocyte. How could it escape into the bloodstream of a normal healthy person unless the myocytes were damaged? We recently discovered that cardiomyocytes can get rid of damaged mitochondria and sarcomeric proteins as part of their normal maintenance. And this process of maintenance is enhanced in the cardiomyocytes during conditions of cardiac stress. And so troponin is released by the cardiomyocytes during stress and recovery, not only after cardiomyocyte necrosis. Okay, now I can understand why troponin is elevated after a marathon or a strenuous exercise. Exactly. This also explains troponin elevation after a simple angioplasty or an uneventful cardiac surgery. 
That's why to diagnose type 4 MI after PCI, we need at least five-fold troponin elevation in addition to other clinical features in the ECG, echo, or angiography. And to diagnose type 5 MI after bypass surgery, we need 10-fold elevation of troponin. In addition to symptoms of ischemia, new ECG changes, new wall motion abnormalities, or clear and geographically documented complications. Then high sensitivity assays made our life easier and allowed us to detect even subclinical infarctions. Isn't that great? Well, yes, the high sensitivity assays led to more patients with unstable angina being diagnosed as non-ST elevation myocardial infarction because it can even detect microscopic myocardial injury that can be missed even by cardiac imaging. And of course, the high sensitivity assays can detect troponin elevations earlier than the older generations of troponin assays. But of course, this came with some drawbacks. The higher sensitivity led to lower specificity. Um, what does that mean? It means that troponin may be elevated in conditions other than type 1 myocardial infarction. These conditions are associated with microscopic or gross myocardial injury, not due to coronary occlusion or coronary stenosis, but due to type 2 myocardial infarction or myocardial injury. Cardiac conditions like heart failure, pulmonary embolism, pericarditis, myocarditis, and even non-cardiac conditions like sepsis, rhabdomyolysis, stroke, cerebral hemorrhage. Then how should we approach cardiac consultations for non-cardiac conditions with abnormal or positive troponin from the ER or the ICU? First, the change in our understanding of troponin should reflect on our daily expressions. Please, don't use the terms positive-negative troponin and avoid the terms normal-abnormal troponin because troponin is not a dichotomous variable. Troponin is a continuous variable. We should use the terms elevated and non-elevated troponin. I understood, doctor. Then how should we handle consultations of elevated troponin from the ICU or from the ER for patients with non-cardiac conditions? So the first step is to look at the troponin values. The higher the level, the higher the chances of having myocardial infarction. Elevations beyond five-fold upper reference limit have more than 90% positive predictive value for type 1 myocardial infarction. Elevations that are up to just three-fold the upper reference limit have only a limited 50% positive predictive value of MI and can be associated with other conditions. The second step, try to take a history. Look, is there any symptoms suggestive of ischemia? Look at ECG abnormalities. Look at wall motion abnormalities. Because if these are present, then troponin elevation will be a myocardial infarction type 1 or type 2. If these variables are absent, then it's just myocardial injury. You mean we need to rely on multiple clinical variables, not just the troponin result. But in many cases, history is vague. There could be a remote cardiac history. We may not have old ECG for comparison, and the echo window is poor. Then, how will we differentiate between type 2 myocardial infarction from myocardial injury? Yes, you are right. There could be gray zones between type 2 MI and myocardial injury. And in these gray zones, and in these situations, remember that the differentiation may not make a difference in the management of the acute phase. Both type 2 MI and myocardial injury are associated with poor prognosis. And we do not have specific treatments for type 2 MI or myocardial injury other than treating the underlying condition, correcting the cause behind increased myocardial demand in type 2 MI or the cause behind myocardial stress like anemia, sepsis, hypoxemia, infection, etc. And if possible, statins, beta blockers, and aspirin would be all what we can offer for these critically ill patients. Oh, but if it is myocardial infarction, shouldn't the patient be taken for cardiac catheterization? No. With the exception of ST elevation MI, critically ill patients with sepsis, cerebral hemorrhage, gastrointestinal bleeding, severe anemia are usually managed conservatively, and they are not taken to the cath lab unless their conditions stabilize. Okay, that is a bit reassuring. But should I repeat the troponin in these patients? Repeating troponin can help differentiate acute myocardial injury where the variation is more than 20% from the baseline from chronic myocardial injury where the variation is less than 20% from the baseline value. Great. Let's go back to the patient who presents to the ER with chest pain or chest pain equivalents. Yes, the first troponin should be sampled immediately at presentation after doing the ECG and the results should be sent to the lab immediately. But we also have point of care troponin tests that don't need to be sent to the lab. Why shouldn't we use them better? Point of care troponin testing is becoming widely available in the emergency department. The advantage of the point of care tests 
course, is a shorter turnaround time, but the drawbacks are many. Lower sensitivity, lower diagnostic accuracy, and lower negative predictive value. Therefore, the point-of-care troponin tests cannot be considered high sensitivity assays. Okay, and for the high sensitivity test, do we expect variations based on age or gender? Yes, there are some confounders for troponin elevation in patients presenting with suspected non-ST elevation ACS. These variables are age, kidney functions, time of the onset of the pain, and the gender. Patients with chronic kidney disease may have elevations of troponin up to 300% the normal value. The time of the onset of chest pain can result also in 300% variation. Males can have 40% higher levels than females. Elderly patients may also have higher values. Despite these potential baseline differences in troponin values, absolute changes in high sensitivity troponin are still diagnostic and prognostic regardless of these variables. Got it. We took the sample, sent it urgently to the lab, and got the result. What's next? If troponin is elevated in the setting of chest pain, this shifts the diagnosis to MI, the situation becomes of a higher risk and will usually prompt admission to the ICU followed by cardiac catheterization. But what to do if the troponin was not elevated? One of the attractive features of high sensitivity troponin is that early changes in the absolute levels within one hour or two hours can provide incremental diagnostic value over the single assessment at baseline. And this allows us to use the protocol of rapid rule in and rapid rule out, which results in shorter stays in the emergency department. So we can count not only on the initial value, but also on the change in values over one hour or two hours. This is the ESC, European Society of Cardiology, zero one hour or zero two hour algorithms. What do the zero and the one or two refer to? The zero one hour algorithm refers to the time points at which the blood is taken. The first sample should be taken once the patient presents to the emergency, that's the zero. The second blood draw needs to be taken exactly after one hour or two hours after the first draw. Then we will have two samples and based on the results, the patient will flow in one of the three pathways, a rule out pathway, a rule in pathway, and an observe pathway. Let's start by the rule out pathway. If the patient presents with very low values, or if the patient has low values and no meaningful increase after one or two hours, this would be a rule out pathway. That means we ruled out myocardial infarction. When it's used with clinical and ECG variables, the zero one hour protocol can identify candidates for early discharge and outpatient management. However, keep in mind that ruling out MI does not rule out coronary disease, and these patients will not always be managed medically. Some of these patients, if they have high risk features, will still benefit from an invasive approach. It just means that they don't have a myocardial infarction. Yes, they can still have unstable angina. I know. And now what about the rule and pathway? If the initial troponin is elevated or there is a significant increase after one hour or two hours, this means a roll in, an MI roll in. The vast majority of patients who will go into the roll in pathway will require hospital admission and invasive coronary angiography. But keep in mind that roll in patients can still have other causes for troponin elevation and ECG changes other than the MI. The thresholds for the rule in were selected to allow a positive predictive value of 70%. So again, it can be pericarditis, myocarditis, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, and cardiomyopathy. And these patients with troponin elevation and no significant coronary disease will still require specialist cardiology care, non-invasive imaging in order to establish an accurate final diagnosis. Okay, what about the third pathway, the observed pathway? Patients who do not qualify for a rule out or a rule in pathway are assigned to the observe pathway. And these patients represent a heterogeneous group. They have been shown to have a mortality which is comparable to the rolled in patients. Therefore, they need to be matched carefully. And in this particular group of patients, we can rely on the risk scores, like the Timmy risk score or the Grace risk score. And we can always do a third measurement of troponin at three hours or six hours. Patients with a high degree of clinical suspicion of ACS with an increase of troponin after three hours or six hours will be candidates for invasive coronary angiography. Patients with low or intermediate risk according to the clinical judgment and the risk scores will be usually candidates for non-invasive imaging and coronary CT and geography can be a very useful diagnostic tool in these patients. I like that protocol. It seems very convenient. Just within one hour, we get to diagnose and assign patients to clear pathways. We should apply it to all patients and make our life easier. Yes, this protocol is very useful, but keep in mind that there are several caveats. 
The algorithm should be used in conjunction with all the available clinical information, including the nature of the chest pain, the risk factor profile, the ECG findings, and should be applied only after exclusion of ST elevation MI or other life-threatening conditions. Patients with a clear pattern of crescendo angina should undergo further evaluation. The thresholds for the rollout were selected to allow a sensitivity and a negative predictive value of 99%, which means that we still have in 1% of the patients a late increase in troponin. So if you feel from the clinical judgment or from the risk score or from the ECG changes that you will need to do a third set of troponin, don't hesitate to do it. Yes, you said it before. We should consider the pain, the ECG, the overall risk profile of the patient, not just the troponin result. Exactly. Another caveat is that the rapid algorithm should be used only in patients presenting with suspected ACS and should not be applied in unselected patients in the emergency department, like patients with stroke and sepsis. Understood. This protocol is only for patients presenting with cardiac symptoms. But I have a question. Do we have thresholds for all commercially available troponin assays? No, we do not have thresholds for the 01 algorithm for all the assays. Keep in mind that these thresholds are assay specific, so you cannot apply the values from one kit to the other kit. You need to talk to your clinical pathologist, to your laboratory, about which assay do they have and if this assay has been validated for the 01 algorithm. If none of the assays mentioned in the guidelines are available in your hospital, then please do not use the 01 or 02 protocol. Oh, that is a vital piece of information. I will go and talk to the lab and see which assay do we have in our hospital to decide if we can use the 01 protocol or not. And how about patients who present within one hour of their symptoms? Is the protocol still valid? The 01 or the 02 hour algorithms apply to all patients, irrespective of the chest pain onset. And it's usually also safe in the subgroup of patients presenting very early, less than two hours, but not in patients presenting in less than one hour of the onset of the chest pain. In these patients, you may need to obtain an additional troponin assay at three hours or six hours. Is there any remaining role for CK and CKMB? And are there any other cardiac biomarkers that can add value to troponin? Among the multitude of additional biomarkers evaluated for the diagnosis of MI, only creatine kinase, myocardial band, myosin binding protein C, and copeptin may have some clinical relevance when used in combination with the standard troponin, although in most clinical situations their incremental value above and beyond troponin remains limited. Thank you, doctor, for this overview on troponin. What will be the topics of the coming episode? Thank you for listening and watching. If you like the content, please hit the like and subscribe button. In the next episode, we'll be talking about the invasive approach, which will be taken to the cath lab, and we will delve into the management in the emergency department, the pharmacotherapy in the emergency department.